I'm going to start. Oh. Uh, See if we can get it. Yeah. Let's get started so we can uh, give, give Brad some time here. We can get to church on time on this one. I'll tell you, it's a it's a sad Sunday we have here with uh, the loss of Jim, and I know that's uh, that's, that's hard on all of us. And we uh, appreciate um, 12 of you have signed up for uh, bringing cookies, and um, we've got three or four uh, hosts and hostesses, so that ought to be plenty. They need to be here about 1:20. Um, if you are able to come to the funeral, we'll probably be sitting together as a class. I don't know where that is. I should have asked Jessica because she just walked by in the hallway. But at um, any rate, they usually, usually it's on the piano side towards the front, but we'll see. You can ask the ushers where the foundations class will be sitting. We'll try to sit together. And um, again, they're welcome. We'll go ahead and hear The other thing we've got today um, is cards. In fact, there are two cards here. We're, we're going to sign them both. Um, so we've got a couple of cards for, um, for Vicki. Um, if you guys will sign those. Is one is back in town. She's yeah. back in town. She was. She had surgery here. Her surgery is here. And what? What, what happened to her? She broke. Her she ankle. had two ankle, two bones in her in her ankle broken, and got that got that fixed. Um, and then it was just it's just a sad sad situation. And the thing that I can't I didn't realize is apparently there was a three car accident, and that there was a car stopped at a at, a, at the intersection. 60, 70 mile an hour highway is what they were on. This car was turned left and apparently he already had his wheels turned. Car hit him from behind, pushed him out into Vicky and with, into Jim with no warning and probably hit on Jim's side. And uh, Jim immediately broke his pelvis, had internal bleeding. Um, his vital signs were very low. They knew him in McAllister, they couldn't do for him, so they took him to Tulsa. Um, uh, they operated on him to try to find out the internal bleeding. His body started shutting down, so he had to quit. Um, his three children got there within eight minutes after the ventilator was taken off. He died. Mm -hmm. So just a really sad situation. But um, thank you guys for your support for them. And Vicky has got help uh, with sister and, and daughter-in-law for a week or two. In about two weeks, we might be providing meals. And we're going to find, find out that when everybody's gone. And that's when she's going to need some help. So um, we'll let you know on that one. And it's going to be a little harder because this is our last Sunday school of the year until we start next year. And and one one sad note for the group, Ken's promoting. Ken, Ken is going to promote to uh, perennial and is going to uh, and is going to try that for a while here. So You're going to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Vote on this. Yeah. You know, we need to I vote. Thought, <laughs> was behind us. Is that a demotion going back? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's good. Okay, um, let's let's get to a couple of uh, big announcements. Um, Room in the End is coming up in January 18th, February 15th, and March 15th. That's in your uh, tapestry or your order of worship here. Um, also, we've got uh, a spring break mission strip coming up in March 9 through 14. Several things to take a look at, but um, I'm here. I've heard that uh, the worship service is wonderful today. We haven't been, but uh, I can't wait. Right. So, Jerry and the, the rest of the choir, I think, sounds better this morning than ever. So. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Kendall, we're glad you're here with us as well. Thanks for you're here to support glad to be here again. Yes. Make sure he does it right. That's right. Okay. All right. Here is our, oh, we had one birthday. We have a Diana early birthday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 39. Happy birthday to you. Uh, actually, um, 30, 30. three, three. <laughs> my parents count in heads. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> mom told me I was 23. Uh, in heads. So it's like a clock. I know. It's a digital. <laughs> I know we're going to have oh, yeah. yes. but I'd like to say something because I'm going to inquire sure. earlier than you. Um, last week I reported that um, there were six seniors who were impacted by a terrible fire in 
uh, district 10, which is Lake Highlands and Hamilton Park. And uh, they, needed, they needed help. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Dennis was so right on it. He kept on saying, Jerry, we need specific needs. We need specific needs. I thought, oh, okay, how in the world am I going to find that out? But fortunately, um, I was able to find out that what they needed from one of um, Councilman McGoo's administrative assistants, I found out that they needed gift cards to replace clothing and food. And so when I gave that information to Heather Mustang, the church came through with six gift cards mm -hmm. for the six older adults. And at the end of the service, George is going to make this big plea on extra giving here at the end of the year. So I don't know if I should tell them how much the church gave, Go ahead. but it was incredible. It was very, yeah. very generous. And so, and the, the Adam and Goose staff could not have been more thrilled. And the Senior Officials Commission is, is just thrilled too. So th I thank Dennis for putting no, me on the you... right track. And I thank y'all for listening to me. <laughs> They always forget the seniors. Yeah. <laughs> Are we rolling? Yes. You're on. Right. <laughs> now you're on. I was waiting for the spotlight, you know. Yeah. Because I really think that. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, I'm Brad Russell. I think most of you have all been here before when I've taught a couple of times, so it's always fun to be back with you guys. I, uh, I brag about my experiences teaching this class because y'all love. I love the engagement. I love the way you think. Um, I love the variety of people in here, so it's always a good time. Uh, today we're going to look at Matthew uh, chapter 10. Um, this is probably a pretty familiar passage to many of you. Um, it's, it's often called uh, or labeled kind of the cost of discipleship. Um, you may know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote a very famous book called The Cost of Discipleship. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who he was, uh, was a Christian pastor and theologian who was martyred during World War II um, and uh, wrote prolifically about um, the Christian's role in modern society, especially about uh, the church's problem of often getting co-opted by the state and getting used by political forces. Mm -hmm. Is he German? He was German. Okay. Uh, and he chose not to escape to America and ultimately he was uh, convicted of a plot to assassinate Hitler. And he was hung. So Just a few days before the war. Yes, exactly right. He was in prison for many, many years, and um, but uh, he's always been an inspiration to people across the theological spectrum, left, uh, center, and right. And uh, so this is where we get this phrase, the cost of discipleship, because a good part of this passage focuses on Jesus' very sobering assessment of the kind of conflict that Christians will find themselves as we seek to be faithful to Christ. Now, I've kind of rewritten the title, um, and so I'm going to call this Clear Eyes, Full Heart, Can't Lose. Uh, does anybody know where that phrase comes from? Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights, right. So where from? Friday Night Lights. Oh, yeah. really? There was a couple, of, a couple of movies and a TV show for a while uh, about called Friday Night Lights, and it was about football in Texas. Uh, and this phrase is the phrase that he wrote in his locker room above the door. And it became kind of his inspirational mantra for his team. You know, if you have clear eyes, meaning you have a clear sense of purpose in what you're doing, if you have a full heart, if you're passionately committed 100% to what we're doing, then you can't lose. And um, I'm not trying to trivialize Jesus' teaching or the scripture or the gospel, but as I reread this passage this time, I really got a, 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 a renewed sense that what Jesus is doing here is not unlike what a coach does in trying to inspire his team and to try to exhort them. This is, this is literally an exhortation, a lifting up and an encouragement um, and, a, and a kind of a clarifying of what their purpose is as a disciple. This is, this is the very center point of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Um, and, and so if I had to summarize this whole thing, and, and we're going to come to, we're going to break it down in just a second. It seems to me that there's kind of a three-part message here throughout this whole long, lengthy passage. Um, the first point is, we have a God-ordained mission to accomplish. Okay? What it means to be a follower of Jesus is to sign on to this mission of God, or in Latin we call it the Missio Dei. All right? um, and, and essentially, what's the mission? The mission is that we go out and any welcoming, listening person... Any welcoming, listening person, I love the Wilshire, we say anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Same idea. 
Anybody can enter into the kingdom of God. And we're there to help them do that. Um, the second point is, is though it's a noble cause worth fighting for, there are forces out to stop us. And we can't be naive about that. And in fact, Jesus is, is really kind of stark and sober and even brutal in some of these parts of these passage about what we can expect. In fact, it's not a really good recruitment poster <laughs> because he kind of he's very frank about how difficult it's going to be. Um, it's going to be hard, and we'll take some hits, even from friends and family. We'll talk about that. And then finally, the, the third point of the message is, but be courageous, for God will sustain you, because our cause is just. And this is the path, ultimately, I, myself, Jesus, will trod. Uh, and you're called to do the very same thing. So I, I think the coach analogy is, 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 is not far here, because... Um, what does the word disciple literally mean? Does anyone know? Follower. What's that? Follower. Follower, okay, almost. What else? Well, it's the same root as discipline. Okay, yeah, in English, uh, the, the, the D-I-S-C, right, is, it, is the same root as discipline. Student. Student, that's really the closest to the, to the Greek word underneath disciple. It's methetes, which literally means a student or a learner. Uh, and so that's why you had this master-teacher, uh, uh, learner-teacher relationship described later in the text. So fundamentally, to be a disciple is to simply to be a learner. A learner after a certain way of life. Now, it got applied to religion because in the first century, uh, the religious world was often divided into teachers and learners. Right? Rabbis, which literally means the teacher. Right? And, and disciples are methetes, which are learners. Um, in, in Dallas Willard's famous book, um, The Divine Conspiracy, he, he talks about being apprentices to Jesus. So one of, one, of the, one of the models for fundamentally understanding what does it mean to be a Christian person is that it means that we are apprentices. We've signed on to Jesus Christ in the way of kingdom living. Right? So, what, so what, it, what that does is it, it, it fundamentally defines Christianity as being a way of life that has to be learned, and that Jesus is the ultimate role model and exemplar of the way of life that is truly the, the life that God designed for us. So, so in that sense, I think the coach-teacher relationship is this is exactly what Jesus had with the disciples that he's talking to. Okay, so let's dive into the text. So who will volunteer to read the first four verses here in Matthew 10? I'll read it. All right. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. All right, very good, thanks. So, so here we have Jesus, right? He has the 12, right? And he's authorizing them to do these various things. Now, to set this in context, Jesus has already been in Matthew's Gospel. He's already been out ministering, healing, preaching the kingdom of God. Um, and, and right before this, he announces that, essentially, this task is too much for one man, even for Jesus that there is so much work to be done. Um, in fact, he talks about um, right before this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Right. So, so Jesus was all about human need, and there was so much, and he ultimately says, you know, um, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. All right. So what he begins to give, with this passage, he begins to give direction to this more expansive vision of what his ministry uh, is pointing toward. So it's not just going to, to, to live and die with him, but in fact, he's starting a whole movement um, where people like us, you and I, um, that we, we replicate his ministry. So, so in this opening line where Jesus says, uh, or he says, he gave them authority to drive out um, evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. How do you understand that? How do you understand the notion that Jesus gave authority to his disciples to go do the things he was doing. What, what does that mean? To me, what it said. 
means what it said. It's always been strange to me. He gave him the authority as opposed to the how to do it. You know, you know that seemed that to me had always seemed like they already had it. He just gave him authority to do it. That to me, I, I wouldn't have known as a disciple. I, I wouldn't have known how to do that. I would have need teach me how to do this. Yeah, yeah. Where's the playbook? Yeah. Right? Right. In that time, didn't people shun um, those with serious diseases? Absolutely. <clears throat> so yeah. he was basically telling them. Don't shun them. Oh. I, I don't know. I, that, that way, that's a great point. Don't, yeah. don't shun them. Approach them. Yeah. Um, help them. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, it, it, it certainly seems like part of this notion of authority um, is not only is it, um, you know, like we understand authority today in what way? Like if, if I say, Robert, you have authority to go do something. What am I really saying to you? Give me the power to do that. Right, I give you the power. Mm -hmm. Um, permission. 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 A lot of times we think it's permission. Like, I don't have the authority to do that. Like, I have not been empowered by somebody over me, somebody, you know, so I don't I don't have the legal authority to do it. I don't have the moral. I don't have to act as a proxy for you or. Okay. Like... Yeah, so I think it means all of those things. Um, but I, I think to apply that to the modern day, uh, maybe it's more like this. It's really more I'm authorizing you. See, it's still the use of authority, but it's not like. I'm giving you permission to go do this, right? Uh, and I'm also saying that you have a rightful claim, right, to enter into people's lives. Um, now, I think sometimes when we get into this authority over evil spirits, you know, we get into the, sometimes that this, there's like a spiritual hierarchy, right, with God at the top and all these spiritual beings. And so where do humans fall? Do we have authority over certain beings and have a vertical relationship? Um, but, but I think a, a better understanding of it is probably what are we authorized to do? What are we, what are we a proxy for Jesus in doing? What have we been given permission to do? Um, what are we commissioned to do? Yes, ma'am. The only thing he left out was in his name. You know, I mean, if Jesus is giving an authority to us, to anyone, to his disciples, in his name, go do it. Right, right. Something like that. Yeah. So is that bothersome for you that he doesn't say in his name? No. Oh, okay. I'm just saying, I, you know, that's the assumption that they're going to go in his place. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's implied by the fact that he only he could authorize them to do it. Right. Right. No one else could authorize them to do it. Um, in fact, they couldn't even authorize themselves. Right. God had to authorize. So there's both... Um, yeah, there's a both a, a movement of, of responsibility to God. This is what God. This is God's mission, not your mission and my mission. <clears throat> right? The mission did not originate with the disciples themselves. They didn't have a committee and get together and say, "What do you think it means to follow Jesus?" Well, I think it means to worship Him. I do. Worship Him. No, but God said, "This is my mission. This is what the Son has been doing, and this is what you should do." And now, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a famous quote that, that basically says. Um, we are called not to hero worship. We are called to intimacy with Christ. And so it would have been easy for the disciples to stop in their discipleship with mere hero worship. Well, Jesus is awesome. He's amazing. You know what he did? And never do anything themselves. Right? And there's probably a lot of Christians today whose discipleship really has gotten stuck in hero worship. And it feels good. I mean, it's certainly better to see Jesus as a hero than to see him not as a hero, right? But what Jesus was really about is, no, I don't want you just to think that I'm a hero, right? I want you to have such intimacy with me that you want to become like me, all right? And so this was the first step. You've seen the things I've been doing, and yes, you're impressed, and so you're following me. But the end game is that you will do the walk as I have walked, right? Uh, as John will say in, in, in another passage. So, so, so that's part of what it, what it means to, to be authorized. Now, what about this notion of unclean spirits? So part of what they're authorized to do, right, um, is that they have the authority to drive out evil or unclean spirits, as the word is actually translated. How do you understand that? What is, what is an unclean spirit? A disease. What's that? A disease. A disease? A malfunction. Okay. Now, the Jews felt that anything bad that happened was the result of your sin and an unclean spirit. Right. Um, 
I so, think I think Jesus and his disciples healed diseases. Physical diseases? Mental. Mental diseases? All of them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Very good. Very good. How else do you understand unclean spirits? So there's this association with disease as a root cause, along with their own sin, and the Jews had that commingled in their worldview, right? What do you mean evil thoughts generated by your own personality? Oh, okay. Personality disorders or just not being a nice person. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, so, so the line is really blurred between um, moral illness, if you use the health metaphor, emotional illness, physical illness, broken relationships. Um, Just generally things that went wrong. Basically any human brokenness, right, in any sphere in which we, we are human. Why is cleanliness, what does cleanliness have to do with anything? Jewish law. Okay. Yeah, so it has deep roots in Jewish law and this, this equation of holiness with cleanliness. Right? And, and we, if you know, you know, we know something of the Old Testament and, and the purpose of the ritual laws, uh, the worship laws that were given to the ancient Jewish people, it was that hand washings and ceremonial washings and cleansings were a, uh, we would say they're, they're a teaching technique. They're a the 50 cent word would be, it's a pedagogical technique, right? That God wanted them to learn about existential holiness by practicing material cleanliness, right? And that there was some equation of the holiness, the purity, the goodness, the cleanness of God. A very simple, rudimentary way to understand that is, it's kind of like your body being clean and your clothes being clean. And, and that's God's more like that than about your... And so that became equated with the spiritual forces, too, that there are clean spirits. The Bible doesn't really use it that way, but there are, there are righteous spirits, there are holy spirits, there are angelic beings that do the work of God, and there are these unclean ones. These are, they're, they're, they're the not-God spirits. You know, they're the not-holy spirits. Right? So I, I think a good way to understand this is, is just as you said, that Jesus has in mind that the mission of the disciples is to address the full range of human brokenness. Um, regardless of what the root cause is, whether that arises within the individual themselves, within external forces that are preying upon them, within social forces, cultural forces. I think unclean spirits can be understood both as personal demonic beings. I mean, we see those, right, an actual being that's doing things, uh, and Jesus casts them out and, you know, kind of addresses them. But also impersonal forces, right, that there are principalities and powers the Bible talks about that there aren't really personal beings, but they're all kinds of, they could be political forces, economic forces. We, we now understand all of those can be kind of evil and conspire against, against people. Um, so, so I think it's, we're so familiar with this passage, I think sometimes we lose the dramatic significance of, of Jesus choosing to center the whole Christian life on, on this, on, on his people, going out and caring for other people. That that's the very center of Christianity. It's the fulcrum. Look at any other religion in the world and try to, so what, what is the centerpiece, right? Um, I would suggest to you that in no other world religion is the very centerpiece of the religion caring for other human beings. As, as the most visible manifestation of the truth you believe in your religion. Now, it's not to say that other world religions don't do good. They do. But oftentimes, it's kind of an addendum, right? It's kind of an ancillary thing that you do. The core thing that you're supposed to do in a particular religion may be to bring a sacrifice or to worship a ritual in a certain way. Um, and there are some good deeds like almsgiving and things like that. But oftentimes, they're, they're actually a, a path to personal righteousness in these other religions. I give a little money, I help the poor. Why? Um, because it's a, it's a pillar of Islam, and what do I, what, what is that, why do I do it? I do it because it puts me in better standing with God, and then if I'm in better standing with God, then I get more blessed, right? It's a, it's a reversal in, in motive, right? We do good because Jesus, because that's what he told us to do, because God has already blessed us and loved us. In other religions, you do good in the hope that your God will bless you and yeah. do good for you. Exactly. And, and so what you see is actually that pattern, which Jesus had observed, actually leads to a very narcissistic religion. No matter what path, no matter what religion it is, 
When you see good deeds and, and your actions as a means to your own end, inevitably, you are still the center of your religion, no matter how good you're trying to be. But when you see that God in his grace has blessed you and everything you do then is out of gratitude and not trying to better your, yourself, but just trying to be more like God to better the lives of others, it's a, as you said, it's a complete reversal, right? And so, and so this is the pattern that Jesus starts to set forth in authorizing his disciples to go and to not think about themselves. Nowhere does he mention, well, he does, actually does at the very end. He said, there will be a reward for you. But that's not the reason for the going. The reason for the going is because people need you. Um, because they're helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. That's why we go. And then, oh, by the way, yes, you will be sustained and rewarded, but that's, that's, that's just icing on the cake, right? Um, why do you think he sent them out in twos, in pairs? Support each other. Okay. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers uh, to encourage one another. Encourage. <laughs> and, and to give one another courage. Compliment one another. Compliment one another, maybe. The, the, I mean, compliment in, in terms of you say something, I'm with you. I think of something else to add. Compliments. Well, yeah. Compliments. No, wrong yeah. word. Yeah. But. No, 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 it's a good word. word. No, you, <laughs> your gifts are different than my gifts, and so together right. we're stronger as a unit than if you or I went by ourselves. Yeah. I think also some people wouldn't think they were just some crazy that was, you know, if there's two of them there, they're less likely to go. Right, you there's know. some validation. You, think you are? Yeah. So, yeah, not just one crazy like person, yeah. but maybe if there's two, they're less crazy, <laughs> right? Um, maybe for protection. There's something about physical protection in the ancient world. It was very dangerous. In fact, we're going to see a little bit later in here a reference to households that don't welcome you. Mm -hmm. um, they'll be like Sodom and Gomorrah, yes. right? And right. so it's that, it just, it's that vivid reminder of how dangerous it was to travel in the ancient world, because it won't touch, well, won't touch on it now, I guess, but um, the, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember that story, it was because two angelic messengers came to visit Lot. So they were, they were strangers from out of town, right, that appeared as physical beings, and um, Sodom and, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, all of them, were so hostile towards strangers that then they wanted and they attempted to gang rape these, these and it's, it's brutal and graphic, but that's exactly what happened, mm -hmm. right? And so it reminds us how dangerous it was to travel in the ancient world, mm -hmm. and it's the subtext of these disciples, the reality of what they're being asked to do. We want you to go to towns and villages where they do not know you, and they, many of them will perceive you automatically as a threat, and, and they may do violent harm to you. So um, th there's a safety, there's a precaution of at least two. Um, there's also some accountability, isn't there? <laughs> like if you ever managed people, you know, it's nice to have a little accountability that someone else is out there, you know, uh, kind of not only the, the positive side of encouragement, but also like, you know, I, I know if you're doing God's work and you know if I'm doing God's work, and so maybe it's better for both of us if we, the right hand knows what the left hand is doing in this sense. Um, so it's, it's very instructive. You know, also be reminded that Christianity is always a communal faith, right? It is, it is a together kind of thing. It's not, uh, we're not free agents. We're not isolated. We're not really to do our work alone and all by ourselves. Um, elsewhere, Jesus will say, where two or more are gathered, there I will be also in the midst of them, right? Jesus was always thinking communally not just individualistically. And so when he sends them out, you can say, well, it would be more efficient if he would send all 12 to 12 different directions as opposed to only serving six directions, right? And our modern day, you know, management philosophy, we would probably want to do multiply the numbers, you know, but Jesus is like, no, the mission won't succeed. Uh, if, if my, and later he's going to say, you were like, you were like sheep among wolves. So what happens to the lone sheep out there by itself? It gets gobbled up, <laughs> right? So there's a real, there was a real pragmatism to what Jesus was saying. Okay. So it gives a, one another support. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if anything happens, um, you know, someone will be there. Um, yeah, there's a, it comes to mind the, um, what's the proverb about if one man falls down, uh, if he has a, a friend, he has another to pick him up again, um, which, is, which makes a lot of sense. Well, let's move on. Someone read verses 5 through 15. This is a little bit longer passage, but we'll, we'll kind of break this down. Do you have a volunteer to read? Uh, 
do not go among the... Uh, okay, so you find them. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. <clears throat> Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Is that what you want to stop? Yeah, that's good. Um, and one of the questions I had, it, is this, um, I was curious as to why he said Israel, and I'm assuming Israel meaning the northern part, it, the split nation. Is that nice talking of all Israel? Do yeah, he's not speaking today? so much geographically as he's speaking ethnic religiously. religiously. He's okay, about he Jews. mentioned some Samaria and, and the Gentiles, and I just thought, okay, he's talking about it, just one <clears> half, <throat> but he's talking about all of it. Yeah, he's, well, he's, he's specifically talking about the people of Israel. Jewish people. Okay. Um, and, and so I think of Israel and Judea when it split. And that, right, you think of the northern and southern right, kingdom, like from I, the Old Testament. No, he's not. He's talking about both. He just yeah. doesn't mention Judea. He, he just mentions Israel and is talking about both halves. Yeah, he's, but, but again, he's talking about the Jews who live in that area. He's not talking so much geographically yeah, okay. or politically as he is talking about the covenant people of God. Yeah. Were they still two separate nations at that time, at the time of Christ, or had they been reunited? They weren't nations anymore. I mean, they were proxy states of Rome, and so they didn't have their own governments anymore. Mm -hmm. But they were still kind of split. Or... Well, they were, yeah, I mean, they were kind of culturally split with a history, but like after the exile, you know, you know, first the northern kingdom falls, and then the southern kingdom falls, they go into exile, they come back, and they resettle, but the kingdoms never materialized again. They were, they were, they were loosely unified, I mean, it's a political unit, Right, but then they had these cultural differences that persisted because of their the histories. But they were never again divided after the time of David, and, yeah, and all of that. Okay, yeah. It'd be like people say, America do whatever they say. They're talking about the people of America, not the country. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and of course, Jesus had this pattern as he began his ministry. Um, he went to the Jews first. Uh, and repeatedly, Jesus went to the Jews first. He tells his disciples to go to the Jews first. When Paul starts his ministry, even though it's going to be to the Gentiles, he goes to the Jews first. Mm -hmm. This is always the pattern. Um, and so that question is, is, why is that the pattern? Well, it was God's mission to save the Jews. I mean, going all the way back to Exodus out of Egypt. So uh, that's why I thought it was. Yeah. I still thought it was a little strange, but, you know, but then you think about it, I guess... The yeah. Jews came first. Yeah, because we all know now, but he's all about the Gentiles, right? He's all about inclusion right. and anybody, right. right? But his his path to get to anybody was first the bodies that know God best. <laughs> well, and the disciples were all Jews. Most of them okay, were. So they were they would probably be more comfortable. I'm just thinking of the best way to get your message across. Yeah. Well, there is kind of a low-hanging fruit notion here, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm saying it's easier, maybe. It's easier in the sense that these people have some familiarity with the revelation of God since the beginning of time, depending upon their faithfulness as Jews. Uh, they have been made ready to look for a Messiah. So there's all kinds of, 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 of backstory uh, on God's work in the world that the Jews had. And also, you know, God wanted to offer fulfillment of their faith first to them. Because they were the covenant people of God. It's God's way of fulfilling his covenant. God keeps his word. It's God keeps his promises. But his promises were not going to be limited in the way that Jews expected them to be limited. And that was what was so mind-blowing, is that, yeah, God was going to keep his promises, but not just to you guys, to everybody that he created. Also, maybe he knew the Jews better than we do, or he just knew people better. And he thought, well, if I go to the Jews first, and even though they reject it, I can at least say, I came to you first, gave you a chance, and you blew it, so we're over at the Gentiles now. 
But if yeah. he'd gone to Gentiles first, I'd have made Jews mad at him. Yeah, his, his odds, his, his, his practical odds of winning Jews if he went to the Gentiles first would have, would have been really bad, yeah. right? Because they would have possibly, it was already scandalous enough yeah. when they started reaching out with the Jewish foundation. Um, and uh, it, it certainly would have been scandalous with no understanding of why we're bringing the Gentiles in now. So it was a process. Uh, and so they were, they were to go to, to the Jews first, um, to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, so, 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 what, so the, what we see here is kind of a, you know the difference between centripetal and centrifugal force in physics? Outward versus inward. Okay, which one's the inward movement? Centripetal. Centripetal. All right, so if, you, if a mass spins around a center point, right, there is a force, uh, the, the centripetal inward pulling force that actually keeps that mass from just flying all over the space, right? The centripetal force. But simultaneously, there is centrifugal, centrifugal force, which is, uh, and, and, and the physicists in the room would, would know this, that while centripetal is a real force, a centrifugal, centrifugal force is an apparent force. So the, the, the real force actually is this inward pull that keeps the body in motion, but it, to, the, to the object, it feels like this pressing backwards. So you know, that's like the old ride at, at some of the theme parks, right? You stand up against the wall and it would spin, and you feel pressed against the wall. But in actuality, it's the centripetal force that's holding you in place, but your experience of it feels like pushing outward. So the metaphor kind of breaks down, but in Christian spirituality, as we revolve around God, right, with more and more intensity, right, there's a sense in which God holds us firmly in his orbit in place. But at the very same time, God is telling us that I want to throw you out into the world, right? So there's this, there's this, this, um, uh, this kind of opposite forces working here. That the more spiritual we become around God, that should actually send us out into the world more aggressively. Um, and that's why in this passage you have go, go, go. As you go, it's like go, dog, go. The kids around. It's my first thought, right? Uh, go, dog, go. I love that book. Um, uh, but it's got, for, the, for the, the apostles, the message is constantly go, go, go. As you go, as you're going, go do this, go, go, go. Um, by the way, what does the word apostle mean? We said disciple is a, is a, is a methetes, a learner. What is an apostolos? What is an apostle? Preacher. Mm -hmm. Close. Someone who carries a message. Someone carries a message. That's an angelos. A messenger. A teacher. A teacher. Actually, an apostolos is a sent one. So the emphasis of the word is on the going. Not just on the tasks. All these tasks are actually very accurate. But the core meaning of the word apostle, an apostle is a sent one. Sent one. Sent one. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so Paul was an apostle, and what made him an apostle is not because he was a preacher and a teacher and all these other things, but he went out. He didn't stay. As it, it's, 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 it's in contrast to, like, a pastor. What's a pastor? A pastor is a shepherd, right, who, who historically cares for one flock, right? They're not traveling the world. Now, we have pastors who travel the world, but we say when they're traveling the world, they're serving an apostolic function. So modern-day missionaries, we think of them theologically as apostles. Were any of the disciples apostles? They were all were. They all were. In fact, were. in this passage, the 12 disciples are then called apostles. But there were also apostles who were not disciples, like Paul. The apostle Paul. Okay. Right. But the, the designation apostle, what it means is a missio missiological uh, task. A mission. Yeah. So, unlike you know, the Mormon church today, for instance, uses the word apostle as their authorities. Right? And apost the apostle is an authority. Um, and and, uh, and the, the prophets in the church. I, I scandalized some Mormon missionaries one time in San Antonio. I was jogging down the street, and they, come, they came um, riding up next to me on their bicycles, you know, which kind of happened in a, a conversation. And how many were there? And how many were there? There were two. There were two. <laughs> they go out two by two, right? And, and their opening line, their pickup line, was, um, uh, do you think there are any prophets today? And I'm running along, you know, and I'm like, yes, 
I am one. <laughs> Which was scandalous to them, but I'm like, look, I'm a fourth teller of the Word of God. I'm a Christian pastor. I am a prophet. You know, which, which to them, they did not fit their definition. So everybody who uses these words like prophet, apostle, disciple, is not always talking about the same thing. They were so, going to have a little trouble recruiting you. Yes, they had a little trouble. <laughs> I was good-natured about it, yes. I was like, you know, just go do some good in the world, and, you know, it's great. But, yeah. And Brad, what you think of all of us here set down in this room are the apostles and sent to the world to do God's work? to spreading the love of God to, to your own family first mm -hmm. and to your relatives and to that's the world you are in, that's why we are here. Mm -hmm. And because God's commission, not just you, but to all of us here, <laughs> to do God's work. To, to give the people the lifestyle that God, Jesus is trying to teach us to, to have. Mm -hmm. To love, to serve, to be a, a people, a giving person, to be hospitable, more generous to, pe to people. That's how the Christian family should be. That's a great point, Robert, because you know, when, we, when we look at these teachings, um, Modern Christians understand this to be a universal call to all of us. This is not, was not just directions for those 12, and it's not just directions for uh, professional ministers, people who are paid to be good, right? It's, it's, it's people who are good for nothing. No, they're good for... Uh, old preacher joke, sorry. Uh, but, but it's true, and, and it often needs to be spotlighted. You, you're, nobody pays you to be good, right? It's not, your, it's not your vocation in a professional sense. But as Robert said, we understand this to be universally applied to all believers. So in that sense, we all have an apostolic function. We may not all go to China, as, as my great-great-uncle, we talked about this one time, yeah. once rode horseback in northern China and helped form seminaries and stuff, and Robert's from northern China. Um, he was definitely apostle in the classic sense. But we all are going. Um, and uh, in fact, in Jesus' Great Commission, he says to all disciples, as you go, all of you, not just the apostles, all as you all go, then make disciples. So really good point. So this, there is a, we understand a universal application to this teaching, and we can't just restrain it to, um, to those 12 or to, or to any kind of professionals. Um, so just highlighting a couple of other points here. Um, so, so one of the things he talks about is, is this whole notion that, um, that one, they're supposed to do it for free, right? Freely you have received, freely give. Uh, and do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. Mm -hmm. So this whole kind of economic model that's kind of built into how the apostles are to live their lives, um, he says, you know, there'll be no pay, uh, specific, no extra pay. Um, you can't take extra clothes and sandals. Um, you can't take a staff, which, by the way, is to protect yourself, uh, to beat off wild animals or anyone else that's a threat. Um, but then he makes this comment, there, there won't be no, but, but the, wor the, wor the worker is worthy of his keep. So what do you make of this kind of economic model? Like, What's underneath it? Why did Jesus dictate these terms, these economic terms, for the ones he sends out into the world? Yes? I think part of it was he wanted them to be unencumbered. Okay. And, you know, the more you have stuff to think about or worry about, the more you worry about your stuff. But I think also to be uh, vulnerable hmm. and... I mean, they're vulnerable, so they're relying on God, but they're also being vulnerable to rely on other people to offer and give them these things. I heard on the news this week that there's a guy every year that gives out millions of dollars and gives them out in tens and twenties to people and tells them to go be a you know secret shopper or whatever and just hand out randomly this money he's given them to people. And this year he did it to a homeless man. He gave a homeless man like three hundred thousand dollars. Oh my! And told him anyone who looks at you and interacts with you, 
give them a thousand dollars. And it, the guy kept, didn't keep any of it, gave it all away, the homeless guy. And, wow. and the rich guy was trying to make the point that, you know, we don't, you know, it's doing the unexpected, it's, mm. you know, paying attention, and, and he was able to give it all away. And then all these people were trying to give it back to him, yeah. you know, or give him something in return. And he was like, no, I'm just doing a mission, mm. you know, or whatever. So yeah. I think it's that surprise, the element of surprise and, and you know, like Advent, we're awaiting and just do your thing and then see what happens. Yeah. I don't know. No, yeah, Linda, those are great points. Yeah, because there's, I mean, what that wealthy man understood was that the way we live our lives economically either draws us towards people or it actually creates more division. It pushes mm -hmm. away, right? And, and, and so Jesus, being the genius that he was, understood um, at a very practical level that his disciples would be um, most welcomed and intimate with the people they sought to serve uh, if they did not come with self-sufficiency. Well, and, I, and go ahead. also that they, because there were people out there doing healing for profit too. Right. It's like in our work, like we mm -hmm. had this come up this week at work, we can't take monetary gifts from people because then, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to expect us maybe to show preference to mm -hmm. their, right. well, mm -hmm. their child. And so, in the same sense, because then people are going to be suspicious that they're, like, the message will be distorted if they appear to be doing this for profit. Or something. Absolutely. So, yeah, we used to call it profits for profit, yeah. right? Yeah. There's always been a religious economy where people make a buck off religion, whatever the religion is. A lot of bucks. A lot of bucks, yeah. yeah. Some quite big bucks yeah. these days with jets yeah. and island homes. And I wasn't stuff. really thinking of it from the disciple standpoint. I was thinking of it from I think he wanted Jesus wanted to make sure that the people they came in contact with accepted God's word on faith, not because of something they thought they might get. Mm. So if there's nothing to get, but I accept the word that you're providing, mm. then I'm accepting it on faith, not because of something that you're going to give me. If they had nothing to give. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying that from the first, like I'm the one that the disciples coming and talking to, right. um, and what their mindset is, and what Jesus, I think, wanted to corral with those that wanted to attract those that wanted to hear God's word, you know. Came from God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the way I was thinking. Well, I, did, I, did, I get talk a bit about the clothes, and the, the gold, the silver, the copper, I, that to me made a lot of sense. The clothes didn't make a lot of sense. Wearing one pair of clothes, you know, you <laughs> yeah. gotta start to read. I mean, I don't want to be near you. So I was just kind of thinking. Well, I'll, here I'll give you an example. So we were, we were talking a minute ago. Uh, Dale's daughter is, is in Tanzania, right? Uh, and uh, so I was uh, talked about, I had a, was in Zimbabwe uh, a very long time ago for a big mission trip one time. And, and I remember we went, and part of what we did is we were in this rural encampment where we were going to. Uh, train uh, pastors how to start churches, which mm -hmm. is really kind of silly, frankly, because I was just learning how to, you know, I was in seminary myself, I didn't know anything about starting churches, and I didn't know but that's how we've done things sometimes. But to your point, I started unpacking my belongings at this camp and started pulling out all the shirts and mm -hmm. clothing, that I, and, and the, the national pastors that were there, young men who lived in a very kind of simple environment, they were just astounded. Mm -hmm. All the clothes I pulled out of my suitcase, and it was embarrassing. It was um, now we were trained to leave everything that we took, mm -hmm. and so we left everything, all of our possessions there before we came back. But it it, it, it made the relationship hard because I just seemed so rich, mm -hmm. and I thought of myself as a poor seminary student, you know. But <laughs> it's like they perceived me. Um, I remember I was giving this little this little battery operated alarm clock I took out, and I sat there, you know before smartphones or anything, and they were just like, you carry your own clock, and you, I mean, I might as well have been Robert Redford on the Savannah in a tent, you know. Uh, it's amazing, it's amazing, we were in Kenya, hmm. I mean, sure. and, you know, we were taking pictures, and I had never realized that some of these people had never seen themselves, they don't even have a mirror, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and yet, in Thatch Huts, and we met for uh, church worship on Sunday, mm. and these men show up in white iron shirts. Mm. Right. Yeah. For for 
their workers. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Africa has become quite complicated now, right? Yeah. Because you have urban parts of Africa that are quite sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? And they have all the technology that we have, and they're not exactly, they're not living in huts, and they haven't lived in huts for several generations and all that kind of stuff. But then you still have very rural areas, and so we have to be careful right. these days yeah. because it's a very complicated picture. It's not like what it used to be. But at any rate, there's all these economic forces are at work, and I think all the things that have been said are valid and true. And the other thing that, that probably should be said is that I think also God wanted them not only to, to have mutuality with the people they were going to serve and so not let money get in the way and all that kind of stuff, but God wanted them dependent on him. That he wants his disciples to be vulnerable not only to the people they seek to serve, but vulnerability and dependence upon God is critical. Uh, and our, our mission or the effectiveness of our mission often gets undermined by our own self-sufficiency. Our wealth There's, is the biggest problem. Don, you were going to well, say something? That's what I was going to add. Is, you know, he, he, he probably told them, you know, I will take care of your needs. So don't worry about it. But then my next part of that question was, okay, taking care of your needs. Uh, I don't know, last week or so, I've been listening to this religious station because of the Christmas music. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and there's always a pause in there. And, and the pastor or whoever, well, I've just written this book, I've just done this, I've just done that, and I'll be glad to share it with you for whatever you, know, for whatever you mail in to me. It doesn't matter if it's $5 or $500. Right. And I thought, no, what would God think about that? Can't you just send it out free? Right. And then if they want to send you something, that's up to them. But I have a real problem when they're asking for it up front. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, well, absolutely right. I mean, that's, if you know the history of Billy Graham, right, Billy Graham never took an absorbent salary. He didn't amass personal wealth. Uh, he was, because he grew up in an era of the radio personalities that, that it, was, it was a whole economic mm -hmm. model to amass personal wealth, uh, he never did. Uh, and he was, his kind of, his integrity, you know, he was known for that his whole life, of that being a man like that. Um, I was always taught in seminary, you know, that a pastor should, should never, should, there's lots of conversation around this, but should make kind of the medium salary of his congregation, right? Mm -hmm. So he would not be obliged to the rich or the poor unequally, but he would be an every man, right? Uh, and that was just a, that was a model that was carried around for years, and that's not a judgment on anybody or anything, um, but um, that was kind of in a, a desire to honor that. In contrast, you have Catholic priests think about poverty, yeah. right? And these very verses they cite as 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 the justification for about poverty. That they own no physical property, right? And the church for generations has kept their priest in poverty and utter dependence not just on God, but on the church hierarchy itself, which some of us would say is fundamentally the problem with the church. <laughs> because the hierarchy itself becomes more important than loyalty to God. Uh, and we can have a long conversation about what that looks like in the real world. But let, let's hear some more of these verses before, before we break away today. So... Um, uh, let's see, where do we lay off? Um, 16. 16. Yeah, so um, let's read 16 through 24. Or 25. See, so, yeah, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? All right, very good. Well, we're almost out of time here, but... Um, Obviously, Jesus is very frank with them about this, this blitz of persecution that can come from all kinds of sources, from religious authorities, civil authorities, family. And the bottom line is, it says, you know, you should expect this. This is exactly how they treated me. This is how they've always treated the prophets. 
let me leave you with one thought before we hand over to Dennis, and that is this. If Jesus were, were giving his coach's pep talk today, in our context, not in the first century, in the context of 21st century America, how would the teaching be different? Um, what are our perils today? Right? What are disciples, what are the barriers to disciples being faithful today? What are the forces that seek to co-opt our mission? We can have a really long conversation about that, but I think it's very different. Uh, and in fact, in some ways, the opposite forces are at effect. We are not a minority so much as we've been a majority. You know, what is it that steals Christians of their power today? And oftentimes it's because the very forces don't persecute, but they pamper. They seek to manipulate Christians, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and use them in ways and, and give them one thing over here to make them happy um, and get them to not to look the other way while the powers that be are doing other things. So that's a good thought question is to look at these verses, go home and think about what would Jesus' word be today in our context? Because, you know, when we all have Christian brothers and sisters who have all signed on, but maybe we're not all really thinking about the same Jesus and following Jesus the same way. So, interesting thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's go through this. I need to get somebody to take a picture of these because I forgot my phone today. It's in mail to me. But to do that right after we finish, here's who we may add. Of course, the family of Jim Beasley. Um, I added to the list that Henry Stone is sick. Henry would have been here. He's, he's uh, had fever all day yesterday. He didn't want to, he, he thinks it was, it was going to break, you know, that night or whatever. If it is, he's going to come to the funeral tomorrow. But we um, just ask for prayer for him on that one. <coughs> Dale and her husband are traveling to Tanzania to see their daughter. That's great. How long will you be gone? Ten days. Ten days. Wonderful. Be traveling safely. I keep that dog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pray for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Laura's added Liam Blake. This is the child of the teacher that she's been substituting for, is still having seizures. So He's in the hospital this week. He's had continuous seizures, well, mm -hmm. since Nothing. he was born. And they are in Children's Hospital Dallas to try to figure out what they can do because they've exhausted all <coughs> medication. medications. Okay. And so, just keep them in your prayers. Okay. And then, if I can probably tell quicker about okay. the one I um, a friend of ours named Robert Hall, and he passed away suddenly Tuesday morning. His wife went in to wake him up, and he was dead. He had had pain in his left shoulder for three days, but he didn't go to the doctor, and he had told her that night, the night before. If, it's still, if I still have this pain tomorrow, I'm going to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And he left her and two teenage girls. And he was our plumber, too. And he was in our neighborhood. He was great. He was honest. He was reasonable. And he was the most knowledgeable. I didn't know anything. there was anything above a master plumber, but there is. If you own a business and have people working for you, you have to have that. And he had that certification. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, he was just <laughs> a great friend. So I said, I'm sorry for that loss. And they're going to have financial. Uh, his wife, Shaylee, sent me a message and I asked her, I said, hey, what can we do for you? And she said, pray for us. She says, with him gone, we're going to be in financial bind. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And then Diana's parents, safe travel for them as they come in from Santa Fe. Yeah. Maybe you would put through the New Year or they so and they may end up driving to Nashville too. So just Jim uh, <laughs> and, and Vicky's accident it just makes me very nervous to be on the road. You know, okay. maybe just don't follow your advice. No, no. Uh, that's why we just need to pray. Cause yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Anything to add to our prayer list? Brad, we appreciate you leading us. Yes, we're glad you're here with us. Yeah. Well. So, let's pray and then we'll go to church. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day, a time that we can come and study your word um, and read the scripture and discuss it, try to understand your meanings uh, that you have and the information you have for us. Thank you for the time and preparation that Brad put into the lesson um, and help us that we can go this week and, and think on the, on the things of this lesson in, uh, in our lives. 
Father, we pray for the family of Jim Beasley and for Vicki as she's lost her husband. Uh, and the other people in the accident as well who must feel terrible as well. We pray for Henry and hope that he is returned to his health uh, soon and be 